Hey, this is a PB review video of my fastest Dragon Quest 6 time. I'm going to mostly just kind of cover the the more important parts that we're going to skip around in the video. We're definitely <laughs> not going to be here for eight hours, but uh, yeah, we'll spend some time just talking about random things, how this run went, and some of the strategies that I used. Nothing really interesting in the first few minutes, we're going to skip ahead. Um, it's very standard through the first 25 minutes of the run or so. Uh, you kind of come to the beginning after the initial set of cutscenes. You get a leather hat right in the beginning. You typically use most of your resilience seed, which is what I just used for increasing defense on Hassan later, but at the very beginning of the game, you use it on the hero. And it's usually either plus three or four. I think those are the only two values I've seen. So, uh, the first area can be pretty, uh, you can get into a lot of fights. Unfortunately, the encounter rate is pretty high, but you mostly run from them. So, come here. Uh, when you get to this town in Chiena, you just need to do a bunch of purchases, but really you just have to um, barter with these guys, go back and forth, get money. You pick up a Thief's Key, you pick up Chimera Wing, you buy two more Chimera Wings, you end up buying Scale Armor, you pick up Scale Shield here, an Agility Seed, and that's mostly it. So you get pretty well outfitted with equipment by this point, between the hat, the scale armor, and the scale shield. So, skip ahead. Once you get through this, uh, you... Uh, once you get the yeah, you just, you go to the, the northeast, or northwest. Fall through the hole, go to the real world for a bit. Uh, none of this is really that. There's really not that much variance in the, the very beginning. Another example of Often, your life force nuts go to Hassan, but at the beginning of the game they go to the hero, which is what we just got there. A pretty standard opening. We make our way back to Life Cod after rescuing the the guy who makes the uh, the veil for Tanya here. Cutscenes. Uh, nothing really interesting yet. You get the pass through Radoc, and then you come over here. You can mostly skip ahead. At this point, you start making your way towards the tower, and you have your first boss. So, actually, let me, I'll show you that. This went pretty well. This is a large fight, but you get the boomerang, so you want to get to level 3. So, although this fight took a little while to, to finish, I got level 3 off of this, which is the minimum for the fight. Outside of my first run, I, I always do the first boss battle at level 3, which is standard. You can do it at level 2 if you're willing to risk it. Uh, but we can skip ahead. Uh, yeah, it's pretty important to make sure that your inventory is full of herbs. And then, yeah, this fight. This is the first boss fight. Just Tower Soldier. Um, really nothing crazy here. All he does is either attack or build up power to increase his next attack. But he can just do build up two times in a row, or three times or four times. He can just consecutively hit build up over and over. And uh, yeah, if he does that, he's basically just wasting actions. So it's generally good for us. So you can see here that he's building up multiple times, so it just means that I can focus on attacking instead of healing. But there's really nothing that interesting about this fight, it's usually over within uh, two minutes or so. Come up here, finish this. Um, all of this still... It's pretty stable even from here. <laughs> Try to do a little lineup tech there. Um, We'll be collecting small metals the entirety of the way. We only have two so far, but we're going to need 70 by the end. So, more cutscenes here. Uh, we, after this, yeah, it's pretty important to pick up. Like, that's the, you pick up a silver barrette, I think. We'll need to sell that, and we'll have to sell many more things later in the run. 
Uh, but yeah, make our way to the woodcutters. We're not fighting anything for a little while. We just need to survive. Get some cutscenes here. This cave can be a little dangerous with Babbles poisoning you. We pick up some equipment for Hassan, and then we're just off. Uh, off to San Marino. Again, all you really have to do is survive here, so... This whole stretch, like, went okay. There was nothing really that bad or... wrong. Yeah, like, right here you can see that... Taking herbs out of your bag to put on a character and then opening the character's inventory to use the herb is uh, it's kind of annoying and slow, but if you want to heal, you have to do it. You also want to conserve your herbs, because especially when you go fight Mudo 1, you want to make sure that Barbara and Hassan have enough herbs. So, like right here, I pick up a quote-unquote safety herb. You do a bunch of stuff here, you pick up the Iron Claw few more cutscenes. And importantly, you put the... Yeah, right here, you put the Bamboo Spear on the hero, so that when you fight Metal Slimes, you have the opportunity to do single target, which has a chance of critical. So yeah, this is me putting uh, herbs in the inventory. Hassan's inventory. Alright, moving forward. More cutscenes. Malayu shows up. We make our way over to Grandma's house. Um, importantly, here, you need to make sure there are two slots for the hero to get the Star Fragment, which is what we use in the next boss. Pick up a Magic Nut. So this is where, this is really where the, the first, like, signs of variance in the run really start to occur. This walk down here is actually quite dangerous. Actually, I don't remember, I might wipe here, which is all, not all that uncommon. Some of the fights can be pretty nasty. Okay, I did not in this run. I think it was the previous run where I just, like, before even getting into the cave, I got dominated. Enemies start having pretty powerful spells between Fireball, which can hit everybody for around 15 damage, and then single target Ice Bolt for about 20 damage. Babbles hit you for about 5, but they can poison you and you don't really have a good way of dealing with it outside of one antidote herb that you pick up. So, um, getting through this cave can be a little annoying, but it's usually not so bad. Just really depends if one fight goes terribly wrong. I think this whole stretch actually went really well, yeah. Okay, so Bloody Paw. Bloody Paw is where you use the star fragment that you picked up from grandma's house. It has a 50% chance to confuse, and then while the enemy is confused, they have a 6% chance to run away. So um, this is me doing a little bit of inventory space management so that I can get a few herbs on Hassan, make sure the hero got the magic nut so that he can increase his MP. And then it's pretty standard. You just Defend with Hassan, try to confuse. If it works, you start running away. In this case, I use I spend a turn in battle to use the magic nut so I don't have to do it outside of battle. There's a lot of little optimizations like that. And then, yeah, once you're set up, you make sure that you, you get healed up while the enemy is confused. And then you basically just spam run away, wasting your turn, because you're going to let the enemy try to run away. So I think this was, yeah, so I just skipped ahead a minute, so I was here for, yeah. Honestly, uh, that's pretty good. So that probably took like 12 or somewhere around 12 confused turns from the enemy to just straight up run away. So pretty good. It was pretty good Bloody Paw. I'm super, super happy with a Bloody Paw that's like that. It can go far worse because Bloody Paw can, uh use upper on himself twice so that his defense is the max that he can get it to so that his own actions if he's confused he tries to hit himself and um if he buffs his defense and then start trying to attack himself and only do one damage he can also paralyze himself which means that he just does nothing, including he won't ever run away. So then your party is only going to deal like one to two damage to him because his defense is maxed and then you're there for uh, it's usually about seven minutes, which is kind of ridiculous. Okay, anyways, Bloody Paul went well. This is standard strategy. 
That was actually a really good death warp compared to some of my other runs. Death warp was fast. You want to get out of there as soon as possible, so I unequipped the hero, and then try to get into battles, and it was quick. Uh, thankfully, a lot of cutscenes in this game revive your characters, so that is really nice. So I don't have to spend time reviving, because reviving characters is actually really slow. So being able to do it via cutscene after a death warp is super good. Alright, we get our forms back. Uh, we basically make our way over to Radoc in the real world. Um, we do a bunch of inventorying here. Basically, we sell a bunch of stuff that we picked up along the way. Pick up the royal clothes, which is story required. <laughs> I spent like a second remembering that I wanted to align correctly right in the middle, just like that, to save some uh, frames, but <laughs> I wasted more frames thinking about it. Anyways. Uh, yeah, come here. It's just some cutscene stuff. Come back in here. This is a very important shop. You pick up the silver barrette here after selling all of Malayu's inventory. And... The silver barrettes are used for the rest of the game. They're very cheap, plus 20 defense accessories that are extremely good. And then you also pick up a thief's key here. Do a few other things. Uh, so, I guess just quickly, <laughs> there's a big concept in this game about, like, efficient equipment, right? So, what I just did was, I gave, or I bought the pieces of equipment for all three characters, but on Malayu specifically, I gave it to her, but I did not, so when you buy a piece of equipment, the merchant will ask you if you wanted to equip it. And you can do it if it's the only thing that you need to equip, then it's usually efficient to do, to say yes. But if you have to equip multiple things at once, then you do the menu that I just did right here, which is you open the manual uh, miscellaneous equip menu so that you can equip multiple things at once. And you can see that if you do it right, it's very fast. So generally, if you have to equip multiple pieces of equipment, when the shopkeeper asks you if you want to equip something, you have to say no. And then you wait until you have a big bulk of stuff to equip, and then you equip it all together. And stuff like that, it's everywhere in this run. You really have to pay attention to who's got what inventory at what points, and try to save down on quite a bit of time if you do it all correctly. This is a good example of a battle kind of going south. Um, and this is, this is a result of trying to play a little bit more optimally, where Malayu hasn't equipped anything yet, so she's taking more damage. That was a lot of damage, though, so I was scrambling a little bit to try to figure out what I need to do. But basically, I just put Malayu back into the wagon so she wasn't in the active party for the battle. And then before I come here, I have to set her back at the front. Uh, come to Amoru... Standard stuff, you just have to do some story triggers. Um, so come over here to pick up the Usamimi band, and then we'll be equipping all of our stuff very soon, maybe right now. Okay, maybe on the way out. Come down here for Water of Amoru. We can probably use that against Mudo 1 or Mudo 2 3. So that right there was me equipping three things at once rather than saying yes to the shopkeeper. And you can see how fast that menu was to equip stuff at once. Okay, uh, this cave went horrible. I did not... F Wait, I was this the attempt where I, I saw four metal slimes and all of them ran away? Uh, actually, I think it was not this attempt. I think this attempt, I literally... No, no, hold on. Maybe it was. Yes, it, it was this attempt. So, I saw four metal slimes, including two, at the very beginning of this cave, which would have been great to get. Uh, but they all ran away as soon as they could. I got ambushed by this fight as well. So there was one turn where I didn't do anything and one of them ran away. And then the next turn, it ran, the other one ran away. And this happens twice more, like almost back to back, I think. Here's another one, ran away. Here's another one, instantly ran away. And then I spent the next six minutes grinding. 
and not finding a metal slime, which is terrible. It's just a really, really bad segment. At this point, I was like, I was irritated because the run up until this point was good. Bloody Paw fight went really well. And like, this happens and it's annoying, but it's not that big of a deal. But some of the stuff that happens later before Mudo um, was also really slow. So, anyways, once you. Uh, the whole point of having to grind to level 7 is so that your hero learns Rukani, which is Sap's spell, to lower defense. So, once you get set up with that, this fight is much, much more manageable and fast. Basically, Malayu has defense up. Hero has defense down spell. And you just kind of buff and debuff and get set up. Your hero and your... Your... Your hero and Hassan can get confused, but Malayu can't get confused, which is one of the boss's main actions. But it's really not that threatening. Once you land two casts of Sap, he just sort of melts, so I think this fight went pretty well. I think the hero didn't get confused much, so it was pretty good. But this, this fight is not super interesting once you get set up. I've never died to it, I've never really had problems. It's just, once you get to level 7, you have no issues. Got lost there a little bit. There's no more encounters, so... Uh, we wait to get the chest until the fight is over. Get the magic water. Uh, pick, pick up a battle lat or sorry, iron claw. Here I checked to make sure that my inventory was open so that I can collect the magic nut for the hero, which is important. Yeah, then we leave uh, from here. Yeah, it's just a lot of like small inventory and stuff. Like Malay is in the front here so that she can pick up the agility ring. There's a lot of that throughout the run. Certain characters are supposed to be the lead at certain times to get certain items in their inventory. But then you have to make sure that their inventory isn't full or else it'll go to the next character or it'll go to the bag depending on who's in the party. Anyways, definitely not fast, unfortunately. That was a really slow cave, but the rest of the run up until this point was pretty good. Uh, pick up two iron shields here. Sell that iron claw that we just got. Uh, we can progress a little bit further. Okay, so at this point you go to Radok, and then you walk to the Ramir tower. Get the, gotta get the Ramir here. Um, This poison... Enemy fight? Yeah, so I'm just making sure that this this was like a example of Malayu had one too many things in her inventory. So I had to make some room because she's supposed to pick up that iron breastplate and equip it in the first turn of this battle. Uh, so this is a boss fight. It's kind of annoying sometimes. Basically, early on in the fight, you want the hero to land sap, but the target of the sap is random. And you want him to hit the sap on the leftmost guy because you're going to be using boomerangs and you want to most efficiently hit from left to right, but it's purely random. At this point, uh, I got lucky. Well, I got unlucky that that one didn't land because it missed, but the first two did, or did hit and it was number one and number two got hit by sap. So I think at this point I try to do Rukani one more time and then we just start fighting. But it's pretty similar. Okay, so I think everyone's debuffed once, so I wouldn't be surprised if I... No, I, I tried again. Okay. Um, middle. But it's the same as before, where Malayu's got the defense up spell. She also has the antidote spell. These guys have two types of poison. One is poison breath attack, where they spend their turn trying to poison you, and you get hit by toxic, which is the worst of the two types of poison where it actively poisons you per turn. The other type of poison is just while you're walking around on the world map or in a dungeon, they'll take damage. And that comes from the, it's like an added effect of their physical attack. If you get hit by the, the weaker poison, it means you can't get afflicted by the stronger poison. So it's actually nice to have for this fight and then you just cure it after the fight. 
Anyways, this fight is not really that dangerous, so... Um, once you get set up, you just gotta watch your HP. Malay has got more than enough MP to deal with this fight. Um, you don't want to spend a ton of MP because you need her MP pool to survive the rest of the dungeon, but it's really not that dangerous. Okay, uh, this tower is extremely, extremely variant. This run, it was a really, really, really bad tower. So on top of the, the cave that I had before, I lost a lot of time, and I was like pretty much ready to reset. But I, I said that I was just going to play through Mudo, and I did, and we'll see later that Mudo went really well. But this whole tower, I just got into fights so much, and I got, I got put to sleep with my whole party three times throughout this run. And the first one is here, and I had never been put to sleep with my whole party in my entire time playing this game. So it's pretty ridiculous. I uh, picked up a Strength Seed there. Um, I'm just going to go forward. There were just like a lot of fights. The encounter rate in this area is really, really high. But sometimes fights are really not a problem. You can get away from them. And sometimes you just are there forever because you just can't run away. Even that wasn't great. And some of them are very dangerous. I'm healing. Yeah, this fight. Let's just watch what happens. We're going to... I actually want to see how much time I lost. I think I was here for like two minutes. So I failed to run away. They put my party to sleep. Um, let's see. Yep, my whole party got put to sleep on my first runaway attempt. Unlike Dragon Quest 3 in this game, when you get hit by a physical attack, you have a chance of waking up, which is very nice. Uh, so I failed to run away again, and then I got failed to run away three times. And then my whole party got put to sleep. Failing to run away three times in and itself is not common. Then I failed to run away four times. That's why we're playing Dragon Quest 6. It's different. Dragon Quest 3, you can't fail to run away more than three times. But yeah, we failed four times and my whole party is put to sleep, put to sleep, put to sleep. Just can't get away. That was fifth try run away. I lost, let's see, what was it, two minutes? Okay, it, it was, it was a minute. But it was still one minute that could have been literally like two seconds if we just ran away first try. And it's, yeah. I lost Hassan during that. Just ridiculous. And then I just like kept getting into fights. So I decided to not go back and heal and just power through. And I actually lose the hero as well. Or uh, I think I lose Malayu. Just a lot of fights. But I did make it to the end. These guys can paralyze you too. Both, or I guess if all party members get paralyzed, then you just instantly die. Or uh, I guess wipe out. Um, yeah, this it's just kind of frustrating. This whole place, yeah, yeah, she got decimated by area all moves here. But the hero did survive, and at this point I was like ready to reset the run, so I just... I was just like, we'll just see what happens. And hero... Hero did survive, which is good. There wasn't that much left, so. Got all four, which is good. And then he makes it down. This outer area does not have any encounters. That's good. Yeah, from here, uh, pretty standard stuff. I had to do some like weird inventorying because often Hassan has the dream scene drops, so he's the one to use it on Barbara. But in this case, I had to give it to the hero, which is just like slow inventorying. Okay, anyways, Barbara joins, get the raw mirror. Things... So, that was like two rough segments back-to-back, -back and I was feeling pretty demoralized, but I was just like, you know what, let's just keep going. Okay, so at this point... Uh, oh, this is another thing. I lost a lot of time here, too. I did not realize that in this game, you need to have party members revived in order to access some story triggers, so... I thankfully figured it out pretty quickly, but it's not like I read the text or anything in Japanese there. I just sort of intuited it out and hoped for the best. And it did work, which is good. It happens again later, too. I think Barbara died during Mudo 1, so... Alright, anyways, at this point, make our way to... Um, <coughs> Mudo 1. 
This cave is... It's kind of similar to the tower where sometimes it's not a problem at all, but sometimes it can be really bad with some of the formations. There are less enemies that do area all moves in this tower, or sorry, this cave, than the tower. But the ones that do do area all moves can do a ton of damage, so it's like pick your poison, I guess. Anyways, this walk actually did go really well. Pick up an iron helmet for the hero here. Make sure that he gets it in his inventory because he's going to equip it before Muda 1. This is the enemy that's dangerous that can cast Fire Bane. The stone beast, the blue, blue stone beast. Uh, but thankfully they weren't really a problem. The flame guy too can do aerial flame, flame breath. I think he might use it here. No? Yes, there it is. Yeah, that did 30 damage to the hero in one action. It's very scary. You you basically can't afford anybody, but maybe Barbara to die at the beginning uh, before even getting into Muda 1. Okay, uh, but yeah, at this point, you're, there's really no gimmicks. You're just kind of playing straight and narrow. Same as the last few boss fights, you've got Hero and now Barbara have the Sap spell, so they're going to debuff. Malay is going to buff and heal. Hassan is just going to always attack, and then you kind of pivot. Mudo 1 starts off with either physical attack or breath attack, so it's one of those two. And then his next action is attack or upper. And then his next action is blaze more or change party tactics. So this fight ends up going pretty well. Barbara does die because Malay gets outsped on one turn, which is unfortunate. Um, actually, I think it might be like right away. But is it here? Let's see. Yep, sure did. And if it's breath attack, I mean, she Barbara's definitely dead, which is too bad because. It was back-to-back -back blaze more into breath attack, which is pretty much the worst thing that can happen. Uh, but then from here, it's not fast, but it's pretty stable. He stops using breath attack and um, doesn't use blaze more too much. Blaze more means that you have to keep everybody's HP at about 50 plus. Barbara takes a little bit less damage from fire. Which is a cool thing about this game. Some characters have innate resistances. Malayu does not take... Malayu cannot be confused. There's some random ones like Amos takes less damage from wind attacks. I think the hero takes less damage from electric attacks, but you don't see many electric attacks from enemies. Anyways. We can skip this. This fight ends up going pretty well. from Despite Barbara being dead. Uh, from here, getting into Mudo 2 and 3, um, this is where you have to go up towards Ghent. There's really not that much that's too interesting about this whole stretch. Um, some inventorying here. This is one of your first sort items to bag. Come into here with Hassan. He's going to get Resilience Seed. We're going to sell all of Barbara's equipment. going to get a Iron Armor for Hassan. And then yeah, it's basically just cutscenes from here until we get to Mudo Cave. Mudo Cave ends up going pretty well, I think. All you need to do is make it all the way there and survive, so um, I don't think there were too many issues this time. This fight is scary though. This one, these guys know Zaki, which is the beat spell. Or whack. Just one hit kill. So. Seeing four of these guys is kind of scary. Also, seeing this encounter is scary too. I think I failed to run away multiple times, but thankfully they only used Beggy Rama Firebane once. So, worked out. This cave isn't that long, but high encounter rate, it can go poorly. Yeah, I saw this right at the end too, but got away. And once you make it here, you're good. The idea is that you make it through the cave, and then you don't have to do the cave again. You can warp to the castle. Uh, first visit to Mudo Castle. Pick up the Iron Mask. 
Hassan gets Spirit Punch, and then we have to get all the way up to get the Fire Claw and Death Warp. These fights are pretty simple. They're like two required uh, mini bosses, I guess. All you do is hit your party tactics so that everybody attacks without using magic. And then the hero uses Sap twice. Hero gets the agility ring that we got earlier. You often are switching throughout the run who's got the agility ring. In this case, you want him to go first in these battles because he's going to be trying to cast the debuff before everybody starts using physicals. Uh, but these fights are really not that hard. Uh, from here, this floor can be very dangerous. You're just trying to run away. If somebody dies, it's not a huge deal as long as it's not like Hassan, I guess. I guess the hero dying would be really annoying too because he wouldn't be able to cast Sap. But uh, yeah, I mean, all of the random encounters in Mudo's castle are dangerous, so. You just have to hope that you get away first or second try, or don't get... Don't keep getting the worst encounters, because some are better than others. Uh, yeah, so at this point, the hero gets the Fire Claw, Chamorro gets a whole bunch of stuff. He basically trick out his inventory. Give him a bunch of agility seeds and some of the hand-me-downs from the other character's equipment. Do all that, Death Warp. Um... Then you... So the reason you Death Warp is that we're going to leave here to... Um, go do an optional side quest to get money to buy what's called the Spirit Armor. Which is an incredibly good piece of equipment. So now that we have the Fire Claw, Hassan and the Hero are going to do the side quest in Taruka. Hassan's gonna keep the Gent Cane for a while. Hero's gonna have the Fire Claw. And that's generally how it goes. Hassan heals and punches a bit in this fight, but pretty soon he's just gonna be healing in Mudo 2 and 3. And Hero's gonna be the primary damage dealer with Fire Claw. Uh, there's really nothing interesting about this fight. It's very simple. It's like no danger of dying. Usually take out the right guy first. Smoke. And big. Uh, yeah, I messed up here. Anyways, you come to Shiena. You have basically just enough money, so we sell Hassan's Iron Claw. Get to 7,000. The side quest that you do gives you 5,000 gold, so that's why you do it. So that you have enough money to buy this. 7,000 gold. Make sure the hero is the one who gets the armor. Uh, we're going to be using this, and this is part of the cleanup that I did for my routing, was to use this armor a lot more after Mudo 2 and 3. You'll be... If you were to watch the full run, you would see me switching it around party members much more often, because it's a very good piece of equipment, and it comes with a lot of good things, like magic damage down across the board on top of good defense. Okay, at this point, make our way back to the real world, go directly into Mudo, and then we attempt. Again, these fights on the way to Mudo, or anywhere in Mudo's castle, are very dangerous. He just cast Murami for 60 damage. Two party members got put to sleep, so... I uh, used to be careful on this attempt through, because you specifically only want to use the hero's MP for healing. You want to save as much MP as you can on all other characters. Just doing some final checking. This is some final inventorying for Ch Chamorro to make sure that he's all, all set up with the best equipment he's got. Hero's got the new spirit armor. Again, Hero's got the fire claw. Hassan's got the Gen Cane. Malayu and Chamorro will be mostly emergency healing through these fights and helping kill some of the enemies in Mudo 2, which is coming up right here. Uh, this was the best Mudo 2 I've ever seen for any practice or attempt that I've ever had. Again, I was not really going that fast in this run up until this point. Some unfortunate things happened, but um, this fight went really well. So he... So I took out the...
the side enemies here. And this is standard strategy. A Fire Claw, Cast of Ice Bolt, Cast of Infernos will be enough to take out the side enemies here, the PROs. So this is standard opening. This is how you, you deal with getting getting uh, rid of them. But then Mudo can summon more allies. And although he can do it, he actually doesn't bother doing it whatsoever for the rest of this fight. Which is super nice. It does mean that he'll likely use both attacks and fire breath more often. Which is the case. He did use fire breaths quite a bit. Uh, but it ended up working out pretty well. You can also use Rukanon to lower your party's defense. Uh, but Malayu is casting upper often. Skara. And you can reset away debuffs nicely in this game. So, so yeah, Malayu and Chamorro are primarily going to heal here. On top of Hassan, literally only healing, so... Um, Chamorro's the one with the agility ring now, so he almost always goes first in this fight. A little less reliable in Mudo 3. Again, this is Mudo 2, but... No, honestly, everything went really well here. Again, he doesn't summon any allies, so he's just sitting there and taking damage. Mudo 1, or sorry, Mudo 2 here. Also regens some HP per turn, so you have to really make sure you keep up the momentum. But between the Fire Claw and some other damage that you can do... It's really not so bad. This fight's only really bad and annoying if he like keeps summoning allies and you try to keep up with them and take them out. But he honestly did not do that at all. Usually what happens is that you try to get a few turns without him summoning allies to just focus on setting up your team with defense up a bit. And then if he does summon allies, you just leave them and s keep single target hitting Mudo until he dies and then you deal with the, the enemy allies. But didn't need to deal with that this time. So this progresses, but this was actually extremely good, so... Uh, Mudo 3, so entering this fight with both Chamorro and Malayu alive is very good, but all you really do in this fight is spam Fire Claw, spam Genkain, and then Emergency Heal. So... Yeah, so the reason this fight is so problematic is that he has some actions that are just extremely dangerous, and some that are very free, so... Uh, it's it's usually either single target attack or huge AoE, and he can do one or two actions per turn. He can also either use this blinding light that you just saw, which is basically a waste of a turn, and it's very good, or he can do single target, force someone to sleep, and that's really bad. Because if he does that, then... It's usually either the hero or Hassan, and it's really, really scary. Um, but we're making it decently through this fight, and Malayu died, but Chamorro's still alive, and he's really not doing much. He's he used the AoE at the beginning, but hasn't really used it uh, since. So, what's also problematic about this fight is that at any point he can sort of just like start going insane. So, even if you get close to the end, it's truly just not over until it's over. But he's, he's like, seriously not doing anything, so... Both Mudo 2 and Mudo 3 in this... PB were super, super good. But we can fast forward, it just progresses like this. Yeah, um... The hero got put to sleep here, but thankfully did wake up. I moved him to the front of the party, because if he... If he gets hit by a physical attack, then he will wake up, and he did get hit by a physical attack. Um, but yeah, we're getting close here. I think Chamorro maybe does die. No, I guess he survived. But it was good. 
large improvement on my quote unquote PB before, but a 224 is still not that great, but so much of what went wrong before was like so out of my control. That was plus six or seven minutes from not being able to get a metal slime kill on the way down to Hollow Beast and then a horrible raw mirror tower. But then Mudo 2 and 3 were so, so good that I I was like, you know what, I can definitely still get my goal, get my goal off of this. So, uh, yeah, so here I'm not going to cover like super specifics of all the run about like what the route is doing and all that, maybe a little less so than what I've been doing up until this point. But uh, the basic gist of it is that you set up your classes now that Dharma is available. But first, we have to go get Amos, so... Uh, yep. So what we do is... So we went to... Uh, I guess I can show it quickly. But you come into here, you talk to Amos quickly. We need Amos in our party. So we do this. Um, and then you make your way over to... The mountain. This is a lot like the tower. The Ramir Tower and the way to Mudo 1. Some of these fights are just kind of s slow and painful. Uh, but for the most part, they're really... Um, I would say this is like far more palatable than those two areas. But unfortunately, I did get sleep locked here. Maybe it's this fight. Yep. Failed to run away and my whole party got put to sleep. How long was I here? Yeah, like 30 seconds. It's not good, but it could be far worse. Anyways, nothing really interesting here. It's a pretty standard cave, honestly. Um, make it to the end. Importantly, I have to have Barbara here so that you can lose quickly to this fight. Start picking up some small metals. We recruit Amos here. So right away, as soon as we get Amos, we have to do a pretty big inventory to make sure that Amos gets the flint, or sorry, the bladed boomerang. Hassan's gonna get the fire claw, and then they're just gonna crank through and do a whole bunch of random battles so that the party can get their job levels up. So yeah, a bunch of inventorying here. This is where we do our job setup, so everyone's gonna get set up with jobs. Barbara becomes a goof off or jester. Hero and Hassan are going to become clerics so that they can learn the upper ability, which is the same move that Malayu has been using. Very, very, very good and basically makes the route possible. Amos is going to become a warrior for a while so that he can learn charge up and double edged slash. Malay is going to become a fighter so that she can learn Wind Beast and also Leg Trip. Tamora is going to become a thief so that he can learn Sneak or Tiptoe, Shinobi Feet, so that you can decrease encounters. And I think that's it, yeah. Uh, well, Barbara is becoming a Jester so that she can learn whistle ability so that we can get into encounters quickly. That's the gist of it. Do all that. We're picking up stuff along the way. There's a lot of metals to be picked up, and in this case, I picked up a Bushigi nut, and I only got two MP out of it, which kind of sucks. For Barbara, it's nice to pick up MP seeds because she. The more NPCs you pick up, the more damage that Madante will deal later in the run, which is her magic burst. Magic burst ability. Two MP is kind of lame, though. Alright, so first battle, Hassan and Amos are going to be on... Tactics. Which just means that they're going to be not using MP. And just plowing through these battles. We have to grind 36 battles here so we can skip ahead come down to this area. So this area has a level cap of 15, so as long as you're not exceeding level 15, 
all battles here will go towards advancing your job levels. So, um, it's just pure number of battles, so... Hassan's gonna pick up a resilience seed here, and then we just grind for a while. So it's a very easy grind. Um, you'll see here that after battle, Barbara has the whistle ability, which allows you to spawn a battle immediately, which is very nice. Do that. Um, so then, once you do your battles, you do a bit more job changing. We turn Hassan and the hero into warriors. They're going to stay that way for a long time. Malay is going to become a mage quick, learn Blazemore, the Marami spell, and then become classless, meaning that her stats will go back to neutral, which is important for the Arc Bolt fights onwards coming up soon. That's mostly it. So we're, as we're here, we're just doing a bunch more fights so that we get our class levels up. So it's really nothing interesting. You're just doing easy battles to clear them. So yeah, once you're all set up, you make your way to Arc Bolt. Put a party in order. Make our way to Arc Bolt. We have three fights here. This is largely why you do the class grinding right away, because these three fights are actually pretty tough. Well, they're... They're slow if they're you're not prepared for them, but like this fight, once you're prepared like this, it's uh, very easy. But if you're not prepared for it and you just kind of waltz in here, this fight could also take a long time. So the setup and the grind is all very much worth it. So Amos has power up and double edge slash. Hassan has power up and spear punch. So depending on the enemies, we maybe use one or the other. Either Double Edge Slash or Spirit Punch. In this case, we can use both, which is nice. Maleu, Maleu has the Blazemore ability. And then Hero is going to have the Fire Claw soon, once Hassan is not equipping it, which he is right now. And yeah, Hero is mostly going to use Fire Claw. Malay will use Marami. Amos and Hassan are doing big damage, and the Genkane, which is single target heal more spell for free in battle, it's going to be passed among the party members a lot. So, um, yeah, that went pretty well. Buy a battle axe for Amos, some inventorying. We also, part of the route change too is I now buy a, I think it's gold breastplate for. Um, Hassan, which is this 3200, yeah. That's good. Uh, but yeah, that fight went well. This is one of the, the rare sort all items to bag. You don't really do it that much in this run, and it's pretty important not to. But at this stage, it is important to use sort to bag, because when you're doing all of those class grinding fights, you get random drops in your inventory, so... This is a good opportunity to clear it out, and then from here you start tracking your inventory again. Yeah, so we switched the Genkane on Malayu for this fight. This fight is also pretty basic once you get set up. It's the same thing I was just saying. Double Edge Slash, Spirit Punch, Fire Claw, Blaze More. Hit the second guy first. It's not a huge deal which one you take out first. I've seen some runners take out the left guy first. Scott. Scott and Holiday. Um, I think I did get it this run. So once Holiday is down on the right, if you time it right, Scott actually takes double damage on one turn because he uses a move called Psych Up or Berserk. The Japanese is Sutemi. And He'll do more damage that turn, but he'll also take double damage, so... Um, I think it's coming up soon. But you'll see if there's like a huge damage payout. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here... Happened to be that we powered up on one turn, and then the next turn we're able to do huge damage because he's taking double damage this turn. So, like, Blazemore is doing 160, and then... 
Hassan Spear Punch did 360, which is like, or 330 or something like that. Just like big, big damage. Anyways, those first two fights in this area are not too dangerous. Now, though, Hassan has the Gent Cane because the next fight, the accuracy with Hassan and Spirit Punch is very low. The next guy's name is Brast. And Brast is way harder casually than the other two. In the speedrun, with the setup that we have, it's usually like if you get set up in the first two turns, you're going to be okay. Ends up going pretty well in this. Uh, you do play carefully though. Hassan, Malayu set up defense on Amos and Hassan, who are the only ones really expected to survive this fight. And then all the while, Hero, although the Hero has the upper ability, you want him casting Rukani, Sap, so that before he dies, before the hero dies, he ideally gets off Sap. I had trouble landing Sap though, I think I cast it three times already. I think I'm able to get it once and then the hero dies. Hero also doesn't have that much MP, so you're really just trying to land it before he gets knocked out. But at this point, the Amos and Hassan have plus three defense. Three casts of upper. Brass can use Rukanon, which gets rid of effectively half a point of... Okay, so like, if I use upper, say Hassan uses upper on himself, he's at plus one defense. If the enemy uses Rukanon, which is defense spell it'll take it down half of the value of one cast of upper so if you get cast with upper three times and then he uses rukanon say once you're at like effectively 2.5 so once you get set up with upper a few times even if he casts rukanon and you go down to like 2.5 or 2 or 1.5, your defense is still very high, so um, it's nothing really to worry about. Although you can try to survive and make sure that Hero and Malayu survive, your DPS kind of goes down because your real damage dealer in this fight is Amos, so. And then if you have some free turns, Hassan can power up an attack as well. So you see that now and then. But I'm pretty much just like letting the hero die off at this point, making sure that Hassan and Amos are well healed. We'll see this strategy against Jammers coming up soon. Uh, but honestly, once you get set up, Brast is really not so bad. This this stretch is really, really why you need Amos more than anything. Amos' ability to just do damage alongside of Hassan at this point in the game really really helps. It would be such a struggle without him. Uh, but yeah, that went pretty well. Um, at this point, you do some cutscenes. You make your way towards the Battle Rex's cave. Uh, this fight is usually not a problem. It's usually over in two turns. The only really bad thing that can happen is both of the enemies use their AoE. The left guy can use Thunderstorm attack, the right guy can use Windsickles attack, but um, if you play it right, it should be over in two turns. Inazuma. At this point, I had really low MP with both Chamorro and Malayu, so unfortunately I'm not going to be able to cast outside after I'm done with this dungeon. Uh, but there's really nothing that interesting about this dungeon. So I'm going to speed up and I'm going to try to keep this going so we're not here forever. Um, so yeah, at this point you make your way towards Calcado in the dream world. Now that the, the pass is open. More small metals. Making our way through. Again, nothing really bad happened for quite some time after this in this run. Uh, make our way to Calcado. 
You have to do a bunch of story triggers and get some small metals. Camera setup. It's very similar to what we just did in Brass, and that Amos and Hassan are going to survive exclusively. And we just need to make sure that we cast Upper on Jammers. Oh, sorry, Upper on the two lead characters, Amos and Hassan. And you want to land Sap on Jammers before the hero dies. So it's, it's very similar to Brass. Uh, but the difference is, is that you can hit Jammers with Spirit Punch with Hassan which is more damage than what almost can do with double edge slash and it also doesn't have the downside of recoil which is what double edge double edge slash does so almost is going to be the one healing and hassan is going to do spirit punch damage so you get a big cutscene here and you get thrown into the fight uh this fight went well you can if you can get hero to land sap even just one it really helps speed up the fight jammer says 1500 hp um so, as long as you get set up with some buffs and debuffs in the first few turns, it's usually okay. Yeah, I think in this fight I actually did only get one cast of Sap. So that's one. If you do get two casts of Sap, you do a ton of damage, but uh, even one is not bad. But really, like... Outside of some really... Oh, so I did get two there, so... Um, we're gonna see big damage from Hassan, assuming he doesn't miss. But yeah, it's... Yeah, 214. It's really good. So at this point, I pretty much stop worrying about... The last two party members. It's nice if they, they get EXP from this fight, but it's hardly necessary or required. So we can speed up, get past this. But the rest of the fight from here is like pretty standard, right? Last two characters die, but with almost healing, um, it's really just this breath attack that you have to watch out for. But yeah, Hassan was just doing so much damage because Sap landed twice. Okay, from here we have a large stretch of just like doing stuff, right? This is... I fast forward a bit, but we're just on our way to Okada, full stock. We gotta do the trials. This is a large part of where I got some time save over the last few runs of learning and understanding how to deal with the trials a little bit better. I was saying before that I was using the spirit armor a little bit smarter throughout this run as a part of some rerouting. So Malayu right now is going to have the spirit armor on her so that when we get the trial, the first trial, she'll take a lot less damage from first trial. First trial, very interestingly, has like almost no dangerous moves except for one, which is strong flame breath. And if first trial does that, then it's very dangerous. But the spirit armor really helps with that too, so. Come here, we have to go get Pulse, the Prince. Get more small metals along the way. On the way back down. So this is where you fight a battle with only Malayu. The gimmick of this boss is that he uses Confuse over and over, but Malayu cannot be confused, so this is why you make her a fighter, so that she's got Wind Beast for this. A few other battles as well, but it's really good in this. So the boss is mostly just using Panic Dance, but you can't be confused. But the boss can use um, Strong Flame Breath, but the Spirit Armor that you have on helps mitigate the, the damage. Regular casts of yeah Mera right there, which is just the Blaze spell literally do nothing when you have the spirit armor on which is cool yeah right there 72 damage that's exactly what i'm talking about very dangerous but thankfully you set maleo on tactics here so she's able to react and use heal more right away which is good uh but yeah the rest of the fight kind of went like this so no problems pretty standard uh there's nothing too dangerous in this cave there's one enemy that's got Firebane, which can be annoying, but it's usually not so bad. 
our second trial. Second trial is kind of interesting because second trial will hone down on regular physical attacks on the ally that has the least amount of HP, max HP. So right now, single target physicals will go to Maleu, which is what happened on that turn. He has some other moves that don't follow that priority. It can just be pure random, but anytime he does a standard, just straight physical, he'll target the one with the lowest HP. So you spend a few turns boosting Malayu's defense because you assume that she's going to be the one with the lowest amount of HP per turn. But in this case, he hit Hero in the third slot randomly with a different Wind Beast move. So when his HP was lower, it means that the physical attack was going to go to the Hero instead of the Malayu. And you have to be careful because you might think a move might go to Malayu, who's all beefed up with her defense, but if it goes to the hero instead and you're not expecting it, it just means that it, he can, uh, the hero could definitely die. Or it could be any character with lower HP than Malayo. So you just have to keep track of who's got the lowest HP. But once you get set up with some defense in this fight, Malayu starts using leg sweep to try to get this guy to lose his turn. And it's got a pretty decent success rate, so it's not bad. Uh, but from here, this the, the rest of this fight kind of goes well. This is the stretch of the game, I think, where you, you feel that your party is at its weakest relative to the expectations. Both the second, well, actually, really, first, second, and third trial really take a long time. The strategies are pretty safe. But outside of doing some serious grinding or getting better equipment, you just have to power through them. But they do take a while. But yeah, making our way towards third trial. Third trial is problematic because third trial will spam defense spell every turn, so you have to reset your own defense in the menus so that you lose the debuff. It's uh, it's an exploit in Dragon Quest 6 and in Dragon Quest 3 that if you re-equip you get rid of the debuff applied to you. Which is very nice because without it you'd have to have a you'd have to have one of your party members spamming the increase spell to offset the decrease spell. But yeah, unfortunately Third trial here is not susceptible to sap and also it has high defense, so you're just kind of sitting here and hoping for the best. Pretty much use standard physical attacks. Hero's using Fire Claw. Malay is using Wind Beast, but you can see that it's just not doing that much damage. But again, your options are pretty limited and you just decide to power through. The only really bad thing that third trial can do is spam a lightning AoE move. Just like this. But otherwise, it's pretty straightforward. This whole cave actually went pretty well. It's, again, a standard for Hero and Malayu to die at this point. They did die on all three fights from Brast, Jamoris, and this, so they're... they're Experience points are pretty low, but it's not a huge deal. It's very important that Amos and Hassan stay alive, but... Like, Hero, Hero would benefit from some extra levels, but Malayu being dead, it, like, truly does not matter. Oh, this... that's right, this is interesting. So, uh, yeah. Finished this cave, but then afterwards I realized that... Um... Barbara, who often will cast the outside spell if Malayu is dead. Barbara died during Mudo 1, meaning that Barbara did not get enough EXP to learn outside spell by that time. Uh, how much MP did I have? Because I think Chamorro had, yeah. So Chamorro had exactly one cast of Vivify. So I had one chance to cast Vivify on Malayu, who had barely enough MP to cast outside, so I didn't have to walk out of this dungeon. And his one cast of Vivify succeeded, so I was able to do that. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have had to either Death Warp or walked out of the dungeon. It would have been very slow, so very, very good that that worked.
we'll skip ahead for a while here. Um, we get into a pretty big section of just doing story triggers and collecting a lot of small medals along the way. You have to do this fight twice. Once here, once somewhere else. Uh, it's a two-turn fight. It's really not complicated, but you have to be ready for it. It's just power up, power up with Amo Sasan. Kira is going to use Sap to get rid of the defense, hopefully. Maleu uses Murami, and then on the next turn, your physical attackers do their move. Either double edge slash with Amos or Spirit Punch with Hassan. And Hero and Maleu can use Blazemore. In this case, <laughs> Hassan's Spirit Punch did like an absurdly low amount of damage, so it took three turns, but it should have taken two. Okay, anyways, make our way to Clear Veil. Get small medals here. Uh, yeah, Destiny Drop, which is the name of this dungeon. I think it goes really well here. This is another place where the encounter rate is kind of high. Uh, but now that we have Chamorro with the Shinobi Feet ability, Tiptoe, we just get into encounters a lot less often. Here, I'm trying to keep Hassan's inventory clean because he is just about to get the Golden Pickaxe, so I want it to be at the top of his inventory, which is right here. Yeah, so we do some extra inventory to make sure that it's his first slot because the idea is when you get to an area like this, you want to be able to very efficiently menu. So you see that, that I just open the menu and know that it's in the first slot. So it's just a very quick input. So it's worth the setup to do that. Uh, but the rest of this dungeon actually goes really well, so... Oh, this is the third fight. This is the third fight against uh, the onions where I got put to sleep with my whole party. How long did this one take? Let's see. Okay, so we start at 24. Alright. Uh, yeah, that was about 40 seconds of just failing to run away from one fight. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, the rest of this cave was actually really nice, so... All right, finish up here. Yeah, I'm honestly like, it really wasn't that bad. That one fight was slow, but the rest of it was fast, so whatever. All right, get our bed. More small metals. Coming along. More small metals. We specifically want to get to 30 small metals before we fight Miralgo. That'll give us a Miracle Sword, which is extremely good, and we use it for the rest of the game. Come here to witness a cutscene, so that we can pick up the Meteorite Armband after this, which is a double speed, double agility, and double speed accessory. Amos is going to have it on for a large part of the game, and then Terry's going to equip it at the late game. Um, this is the other fight I was talking about with this guy, the Well Mimic. Uh, but it's the same thing. I think this one goes way better. See how much damage Hassan's Spirit Punch does. Right. Here. 199. Definitely better. Okay, uh, we make our way to Phone Castle. <laughs> I was laughing over this fight. The big guy and the little guy together. Chillin'. Pick up a sword for Amos here. More small metals, just a bunch of cutscenes. Um, let's see. Okay, yeah, so at this point, with access to the bed, you go to Metal Kings. And this is where we need to make sure that we hopefully have 30 small metals, which I do. So we got 30, we get a few rewards, but importantly we get the... Oh, I'm sorry, I said Miracle Sword before. I meant Platinum Sword. We're going to use the Platinum Sword in the short term, 
both for fighting and we're also going to use it for the fashion sequence coming up soon. But we also get the Ruby of Strength, which is a plus 15 attack power accessory, which is also really good. Here, uh, I'm taking a safety save. I made a few safety saves in this run for the more problematic parts. We're about to fight Miralgo, which is an annoying fight. Tower Jam. Uh, this tower can also be really bad. In my previous run, I wiped out in this tower. I was very glad I had a safety save. Uh, I, I think this tower went really well in this, this attempt, but it can be really nasty. All right. Um, but yeah, the rest of this tower went fine. All right, setup for Miralgo is it's pretty interesting, I think. So the way it works is that every other turn, he's going to cast Bounce on himself to apply a barrier. And then every other turn from that, the hero casts Expel of move that is going to fail when it gets reflected back onto the hero. So it forces Miralgo for every other turn to basically waste his turn. And then on the turn that he does get an action, he can summon an ally, or he can do a number of things. He can do single target physical, he can do single target Mirami, which is blaze more, about 60 damage, or he can do fire vault, which is area all 60 to 80 damage to everybody, which is really bad. So, um, you also use a setup where your party is spending one turn, so watch here. So this, on this turn, Hassan and Amos are using power-up ability. Miralgo is using his, he's wasting his turn basically. Hero is pivoting. And then on this turn we set tactics so that if an ally shows up, Hassan and Amos would target the ally, but because Miralgo didn't summon a ally, the tactics will just hit Miralgo instead. So it's very clever because it means that you can power up on one turn when he's wasting his turn, and then the next turn you can use the tactics to be able to either hit him or hit his ally. Amos going first there was actually really scary because if Amos went first, attacked Murago, and then an ally showed up, I'd be in a very bad position because the ally wouldn't have died that turn. Uh, but I think Miralgo in this fight, I think he summons allies quite a bit, but only uses Firebolt once. The The worst thing that can happen is him to spam Firebolt more than one time. So this is Firebolt right here, 72, 79, 54, 65. Almost took less damage from that because he's got the spear armor equipped. But yeah. As long as he doesn't spam Firebolt too much. You have the ability to heal with Malayu and Hero. Hero's got the Genkane. But you can only keep up with it so much. Anyways, from here, uh, it's a pretty stable fight. It wasn't exceptionally fast, but it wasn't bad either. It was just kind of average, I'd say. Alright, so outside of Miralgo, that's kind of our last um, boss fight until Gracchus, so take kind of a breather for a bit. Pick up another Fushigi nut over here for Barbara. Three MP is not great either. Alright, do this cutscene. Get through phone. Now we have the water gate key, so we're gonna access this. This is part of, like, opening up the world, basically. So, with your ship, you come down here. Uh, we go to Amoru. Go to Pescani. There's really no variance in here. You're just kind of doing this story trigger stuff, so skip ahead. Yeah, so this is pretty important. This is part of the cleanup I did for trying to PB in this game. Is that you really want to make sure that Amos has the mermaid harp at the beginning of his inventory because anytime you want to go use the mermaid harp you should just be turboing quickly through Amos's inventory so 
Uh, in this case, we had to do some a little bit of cleanup to get there. Hassan needed to get the... He needed to transfer the meteorite armband that we picked up to Amos, who now equips it, and then now at the beginning of his inventory, Amos has the mermaid harp, so I can quickly access it every time. Um, so that gives us underwater access. We're skipping ahead through all of this, which is all just cutscene city for quite a bit. Um, come to the sunken ship to get the ultimate key. Nothing really interesting here. Alright, so this... Right here, we're now going to put the hero in the party. So we're about to do a cave, right? We've got only three party members that come with us because we don't have the wagon when we're in the cave. So it's just three party members. So this is part of the like the inventorying and cleanup stuff that I worked on for trying to clean up and get faster at this game. So what happens is that Hassan and Amos right now have full inventory. So they have their equipment and then they have just a lot of stuff in their inventory, mostly small metals. But because Hero hasn't been in the active party for a while, any overflow from what Amos and Hassan were picking up went straight to the bag. So in other words, Hero does not have much in his inventory and is mostly free slots. So now that Hero's in the party, it means that whenever we pick up anything with this existing party of three here, it's going to go straight to the hero's inventory. So right here, we're going to pick up a... Skip ahead. Pick up a Sword Edge armor. And you'll see that it went straight to... So right there. That says To Wa at the beginning. So To is the name of the character. It's that first letter. Uh, that means that specifically the hero picked it up. And this is important because we want him to pick up a few things in here. Specifically the item that we're here for, which is the first of the four legendary equipment, Sufita Shield. So, get through the dungeon. Uh, this dungeon can be rough as well with some of the encounters, but for the most part, it's relatively simple. You just have to keep your HP high. These guys can uh, paralyze you, so you have to be careful. But here, right here, so this Sufita Shield, you want it to go directly to the hero. And it does. And at this point, I needed to make sure that Amos had a certain thing in his inventory, so I checked out his inventory. Uh, but yeah, progressing along, more cutscenes here. Um, let's see. Yeah, now we need to go to the Dream World because we're about to fight. We're about to get ready to fight Gracchus. But we do a bit of job changing here. Amos turns into a fighter so that he can learn leg sweep for later in the run. And we take Barbara and Chamorro off of their classes. And I think that's it. So now that we have the final key, we can, or ultimate key, same thing. We can access quite a bit of good stuff. Here we pick up the demon armor. Demon armor allows you to... Uh, I mean, it's a good piece of equipment with good defense, but it, it also forces your agility to zero. And nicely in this game, that literally means that you go last. And in Dragon Quest, being able to control going either first or last on any given character is like huge. So it's very, very good. So we picked up 40 small metals and now we have the Sword of Miracles, which is a classic Dragon Quest item. It's a sword that allows you to heal 25% of the damage you've dealt on that turn. It's extremely good. It's really good for Hassan when he uses the double edge slash move because it means that he can deal big damage with the double edge slash move and the Sword of Miracles will heal 25% of the damage dealt, and then the recoil damage happens afterwards. So it means that if he's in like a scary scenario where recoil damage might actually kill him, the order of operations is beneficial because it allows you to um, heal before you take recoil. 
Alright, so come here. Story stuff. Um, oh my god, I got hit by Grabubi. Come here for a power shield. Yeah, this fight took me a few times to run away. It actually wasn't that bad, but eh, a little scary. Oh yeah, yeah, the hero died, but... Um, thankfully in this game, compared to some other Dragon Quest games I know, you can actually revive your party members, so... Chamorro is actually a very good healer. Got the power shield. Do a bunch of equipment. 32211. Some of the shorthand that I have in my notes these days. Now that we have both the ultimate key and the mermaid harp, there's just a lot of good stuff we can get in the world. Not only small metals, but also like what we pick up here. You can sell what's called the echoing staff for 10,500 gold, which is really good. We also pick up the Megazaru bracelet here, which is if someone's got the Megazaru bracelet equipped in battle and they get killed, that party member will spend permanently the Megazaru bracelet and everybody in the party will be revived with max HP. It's extremely good and we need it for final form of Death Moor, the final boss. But we pick it up now. But it can't be... Can't be uh, overstated how good that is. Alright, Gandino, pick up a few small metals here. And then we're off to... Undersea Palace, this is where Gracos is. We only have two characters with us, but we only need two characters. And Grokos uses a lot of AoE moves, so it's much easier to control only two party members. The hero has the Sufita shield, which heavily reduces incoming magic and breath damage. So hero basically takes like half damage from Hassan from all AoE attacks from Grokos. I think one party member got paralyzed here, yeah. If both party members get paralyzed, you just instantly lose. That did not happen. Uh, this dungeon, it's like silly stuff like that that might cause problems. But for the most part, the enemies don't really do that much damage and you can make it through. Pick up a magical skirt here. Krakos himself is a pretty simple fight compared to the others. He's probably the easiest of the, the Dread Fiends. But yeah, really nothing too interesting in here. Pick up a few small metals like usual. Um, but yeah, it's kind of similar-ish. Eh, not really. <laughs> it's similar to Mudo where your power players are these two, but... Hero's gonna be healing with the Gent Cane. Hassan is gonna be using Spirit Punch. Hassan now has the Sword of Miracles. Um, but it's still going to be using Spear Punch, so he's not actually getting the benefit of the 25% on physical attack. Because Spirit Punch does not apply that benefit. That was a lot of damage on turn 2. But generally what happens in this fight is you cast Upper on your party members three times. Grokos can't debuff you, so once you get set up with Upper three times, his physical attacks basically do nothing. And then, as long as you stay healed, um, it's really not a problem. I have to cast Upper on Hero one more time, but healing is a priority. You can also use the Sufita Shield once to deter Grakos from using Snowstorm, which is his strongest ability. Yeah, so I'm using Upper on the Hero now, and that should be good for him. Yeah, and then Hassan just sort of punches and... Does a lot of damage. Grokos says 2500 HP, so... Once you get into the swing of it, after the setup phase, it's pretty straightforward. Hassan can annoyingly miss in this fight, but I think it actually went really well in this, this run. Alright, nothing really that interesting from there. Grokos was a good fight. Okay, uh, let's see. Long Odesseo. This is another example of hero only in the inventory is like very deliberate for trying to 
speed up some of the inventory. So for example, um, we do a bunch of selling here, but now Hassan is going to give his iron mask to the hero, which specifically has one open slot for the iron mask to be received. And then right here, at the very end of his inventory is the iron mask so that when I go to this shop, I can very quickly press the up button and know that the first option, which is at the bottom, the first option from the bottom up is the mask that I'm trying to use at this stylish shop here. Stylish shop is used to increase the style of certain weapons or armor you have, which is we need it for our strategy to get through the fashion club so we can get the beautiful carpet. That's why we're here. So we do three ranks of this. This is a huge part of the routing that I did for the, the run to clean it up was to we only come here once to do these three. We don't come here again to do the Sage of Stone. We cut out the Sage of Stone entirely from the run. Yeah, once you get your three, you get the magical carpet. Sorry, you get the beautiful carpet, and then you need to have de defeated Grakos to finish the Calvarona events so that you can unlock the magical carpet. We pick up the magma staff here, which is primarily used to sell later. Pick up a small metal. We're off to Calvarona. Uh, I have to have Barbara in my inventory. And we actually need to equip Barbara with a bunch of stuff because she's going to actually be a really important party member in the upcoming segment around Life Cod. So yeah, I'm doing a bunch of inventorying here. Not super interesting though. She just kind of gets decked out with some extra equipment that we have, including the spirit armor that I've been talking about this run. Do some story stuff here. Uh, yeah. So from here, we have the magical carpet now. And then we have to bring the whole party over to this area so that we get the one of the four legendary pieces of equipment. Armor of Orgo. So this is what I was talking about before, where Hassan needed to have the golden egg golden pickaxe at the beginning of his inventory because now at the very first slot he has the golden pickaxe which is from you know like two hours ago but the idea is that his inventory has been kept clean so that i knew it was there and i can just quickly access it all right pick up the armor of orgo do some inventorying san marino's got some money again this is locked behind the final key so this is a new part of the route that I learned from Akino, another Japanese runner, this game. So pick up a small metal here, but we do... We actually do some purchases earlier with some of the, the extra goods that we have. So this gets the water flying clothes for tomorrow, which we're not going to use for a really long time, but we might as well just do it now that we have the money. Also pick up a slime helmet for him. And then finally... Hassan gets the Wisdom Helmet, which we're going to sell way later in the run, but it's super good now. Really helps his defense. And at this point, <laughs> at a little loss, we come over here and we're off to the Life God segment. So a Life God segment is the village is burning. You have to do, I think, nine random battles. Or I guess they're not random, scripted battles. that are always the same every time for what enemies they are, but... Yeah, generally the gist is that Barbara has what's called Madante, which is a area all magic burst move. Spends all of her MP to do three times the amount of her remaining MP. So you spam it for every one of these scripted battles. and then you heal her MP between battles. So it's extremely powerful and very good, but if 
Barbara gets killed on turn one before she gets a chance to use Madante, then it's very bad and slow. Uh, but that didn't happen in this run, so... It's all pretty standard. Okay, so... Hold on. So this is entering the burning village. So you have to go find all the monsters. Uh, I guess I'll show it quickly. So this cleric restores your HP and MP in your whole team, which is extremely good, which is a rare thing in Dragon Quest, honestly. But during this segment, they nicely give it to you. But yeah, it's like pretty... There's a, there's a strategy, specific strategy for every one of these formations. Um, the metal soldier on the left takes a little less damage from Madante. So often a fire claw and the Madante will be enough, and then some other enemies get spear punch or just regular physical attack. But yeah, generally it's just like go back to this dude, get your HP MP back, and then go to a fight, and then burst and hope that Barber doesn't get hit. But this entire segment, Barber didn't get killed once, which is good. So we make our way through, and then finally your last fight is this guy. Which is, this dude has like insane defenses. Except for part of the story is that the hero learns the zap ability, riding right there. And he's susceptible to damage from that. He only has 400 HP if you fuse with the hero like you did there. So it's almost always over in three turns unless Hassan gets killed. But he doesn't. So that's good. So that gives you access to all of this story stuff, which is how you get the Helm of Savas, one of the legendary pieces of equipment. We need four legendary pieces of equipment in order to progress the game to get to Duran. So all of this is lined up such that once you get the other three pieces of equipment, this is the trigger to get the fourth piece of equipment, Sword of Ramius. Sword of Ramius is an infinite use in battle item that allows you to cast by kill the two times attack ability whenever you want. It's extremely good. We're going to use it pretty much every battle for the rest of the run. Here is going to have it equipped on for now because he needs to. But later on the run, we're actually not going to have it equipped and just use it as an item. Because anybody can use it as an item. Alright. We're doing some final preparation before we fight Duran. We just got to 60 small metals. Which is a big deal because it gets you the Mystic Armor. Mystic Armor recovers about 50 HP per turn. It's insanely good. Hassan keeps it for the rest of the, uh, the game. It is super, super strong. Perhaps OP. So he gets that right away. We also get the Sands of Time, which gives us one, a one-time use to reset a battle. Exactly one-time use in this game. I don't think I actually used it in this run, but it's a very, very nice to have. It's one of the small metal rewards for 50 small metals. So at this point, take a safety save right before Duran and head over. All right, so this is a big segment. You have to do four fights back to back. Well, truly three fights back to back, but this first one against Hellcloud is like part of the segment, really. I don't save or prepare afterwards, so you just do Hellcloud and then you do three fights back to back and hope for the best. Hellcloud. Hellcloud does a lot of damage, but you basically want to land Sap Spell twice before Barber dies. And then this is the first instance where the hero is going to be primarily using. Sword of Ramius to increase both Hassan and Hero's attack power. So I think I get one. Oh no, no. That was a different run. Okay. So the boss here, Hellcloud, used Magic Ward immediately, which means that I can't land Sap Spell, which sucks, but it's not the end of the world. It just means that I stop bother. 
stop bothering, try to cast Sap, because it's not going to work, and we're just going to, while Barber's alive, try to use the upper spell. Part of the new strategies I learned, too, is that you can... You can use Spirit Punch with Hassan, and it can just straight up miss, which is awful. But you can use Flying Knee, which is a rare, rare use move, um, for a little bit more damage from Hassan compared to a physical attack, a regular physical. So Flying Knee after Power Up with Buy Kill applied, it's pretty good. So Barbara's dead. 343 damage. It's not a lot, but we didn't land sap at all, so. And then Hero's also going to be attacking. Hero is using attack, but then... Oh, sorry, he's using power-up, but then he's just using standard attack. Hero gets access to double-edged slash so that he could use that, but um, it's pretty dangerous in this fight to use double-edged slash because, yeah, right here. Boggy Cross can do it. A ton of damage. You saw there that almost only took 30 damage while the others took 75. That's what I was talking about before that almost has innate wind resistance for some reason. Hellcloud has 3000 HP so you know every two turns we're dealing 500 damage so it's really not too long. Uh, all right so as soon as you get into here gotta revive Barbara. And then we get into the Killing Machine fight, Iron Turret. So this fight is pretty interesting. Turn 1, basically everybody defends and you cast Upper on Hassan. If you can survive this without anybody dying, you pretty much will win the fight. Barbara almost died, which is good that she didn't. Uh, and then from here what happens is that Hassan spams the Protect ability, so he takes all incoming attacks. For the rest of the team this doesn't this kind of strategy like sounds like you would use it everywhere but you really don't because it can be very dangerous with area all attacks but in this case it actually works because killing machine only does single target physicals so uh but yeah from here you want to use madante which is magic burst with barbara but the iron turret on the right can use protect as well meaning that he can take the action for defending and taking all incoming hits for the killing machine but we want madante to hit the killing machine so you spend a turn before that to make sure that almost lands confusion with the star fragment from way back in the game on the iron turret so the iron turret's confused and then he won't use protect and then this is what happens where the killing machine actually gets hit by is basically guaranteed to get hit by madante which is really good and then from there, you can kill the killing machine usually on the next turn. And then after that, you spend the rest of this battle, which is pretty much free. The Iron Turret isn't really going to do anything damage-wise to you. Uh, you spend the rest of this battle getting your HP up ready for Terry. Should be dead probably next turn then. Yeah. But it, yeah. Yep, so we got all healed up. Barbara used a Magic Water so that she can get some of her MP back after using Magic Burst. She doesn't really need to survive in Terry fight too long, but um, if she gets a turn or two to cast Upper on some of your party members, it's really good. Terry is like really not that dangerous, and um, yeah. That previous fight actually went really well against Killing Machine. And this fight goes well too. He... Terry's like most dangerous move is to use the Sword of Thunder as an item, and then it just deals like 80 damage to everybody and often just kills Barbara. But that's not a huge deal because Barbara's gonna get revived from Duran before the next fight. And yeah. From here, both the hero and Hassan are gonna be using power up into double edged slash. Almost is the one healing throughout this entire segment. And Barbara's just kind of supporting until she's dead. I think she does die pretty soon. Um, no? Okay, she survived for quite a bit, actually. But it's... Yeah, actually, let's see here. So, Terry's about to use Riding. Uh, so you see how much damage it did to everybody. Quite a bit. So if he spams that nonstop, it's pretty dangerous. But he has 
Terry has a lot of different moves, so it's not super common for him to just spam one over and over. Uh, but that went really well. Duran fully revives your party before his fight. Uh, Duran's first... Very first turn is very scary. All you do is cast Upper on Hassan and hope that nobody dies. That was literally the best thing that can happen, which is that he did a single target physical that missed, and then he cast... Uh, he cast Bounce on himself, but we don't try to debuff him anyways, so... So the strategy from here is Hassan is going to be casting, or sorry, using Protect every turn. And then... Taking damage for the entirety of the team. Barbara is going to spam Upper on Hassan literally every turn, because Duran can use Freezing Waves to get rid of the debuffs. That right there is the most dangerous attack from him. It's just single target 100 damage, regardless of your defense buffs. And yeah, from here, basically, Hero is the one that's situated to attack, so he, he casts Spy Kill on himself. He's doing power up into Double Edge Slash. Amos is healing Hassan primarily, but if Hassan is at maximum HP, Amos takes a turn to heal the Hero instead who's going to be taking recoil damage from using Double Edge Slash. One other thing, when Freezing Wave hits in this fight, if Hassan is using Protect, it means that the Freezing Wave only hits Hassan and not the rest of the team. And he's always using Protect in this fight while he's alive, so... Just means that the hero doesn't have to reapply his buffs. And yeah, one other thing, so we talked about the demon armor before, but the demon armor is um, the demon armor is the equipment that allows you to set your agility to zero. And then Amos also has the meteorite armband equipped on. So Amos is switching between demon armor in which his speed is zero and he goes last, or he's got platinum armor and meteorite armband equipped such that he should be going first every turn. Now, sometimes he doesn't actually go first, but he almost always does. So it's a really nice thing, this is what I was saying before, to be able to control either going first or last, so. We use it pretty heavily. So this fight, like doing this fight fast comes down to balancing, making sure that your team is safe and stable with Hassan being able to protect everybody. And then Hero's damage output by using Double Edge Slash at key opportunities to try to, uh, you know, deal more damage with Double Edge Slash compared to a regular attack at the risk of taking recoil damage. So you have to balance who you're healing at when. Uh, and if you if you try to get too aggressive with healing the hero instead of Hassan, you can get trapped where Hassan just doesn't have enough HP to survive uh, after freezing waves. So really need to be careful. But this fight actually went really well. Um, I got a, I got many double-edged slashes at the beginning of the fight, and then I think it's over soon. Yeah. It wasn't bad. It wasn't the best Duran fight, but it was also, like, uh, nothing scary happened, so it just felt pretty normal. But yeah, everything up to and including the Mudo fights was not... No, I'm sorry. Everything up to the Mudo fights is not great, but Mudo fights and everything up until this point has been good. Like, really just stable and normal, so. Um, yeah, getting into the Dark World side of things, we have to do this tower quickly. Um, this is a pretty standard tower. There's not much to it. Um, so this fight is a scripted fight. The beginning, Hassan and Barbara on the first team. Hassan uses Protect, Barbie uses Medante. Try to Magic Burst to kill the left and the right guy. This first turn dictates a lot for this battle. The, the Hollow Ghost on the left can cast a Death Spell to kill Hassan, and then Barber just gets murdered afterwards. And if that all happens on turn one, you don't get Medante off. It's really, really bad. Uh, but that didn't happen here, which is good. Barber survived. Um, that was almost using leg sweep, so it actually lost the enemy's turn. 
Kiro used buy kill on Terry, and then Terry used power up, and then Terry's just gonna do like 400 damage here, and then Kiro should clean up. It's usually this extra damage is the killer, yeah. It's a really well uh, routed fight. If it goes well. That middle enemy does a ton of damage if you let him run his course. He can do like area all 120 damage to everybody. So, um, which is like ridiculous. So you have to be really careful. His single target physical does like 140 damage. But yeah, anyways. Uh, from here, yeah. Bunch of inventorying. We take a lot of equipment off. We go pick up. Drango. Lizzie, our dragon party member. Extremely, extremely powerful and good party member for the rest of the game. Also comes with just like... Just like insane stats. So good. I'd say Hassan is the best party member, but... Drango is a uh, close second. And Terry is a close third. All three of them are insanely good. Uh, yep, come back here, get the Reigns of Pegasus, and then we're off to the Dark World. I'm not going to cover this too much, this is all pretty standard stuff. There is some inventory optimization that we do here. So we pick pick up Ende Shield. You have an opportunity with... Um, here, let me see. So this menu here, you can do Kabuto, Yorui, Tate or Otode? Actually, I don't even know what the last one is. Maybe accessory. But anyways, the first three are helmet, armor, and shield. And you pick up the shield because you can give it to Chamorro to offset the other really good equipment that he's got, which is the water flying clothes and the slime helm. So we equip it on the Hassan for a while, but... When we get to the final boss, we actually put uh, the end day shield on Hassan. So right here, picked up a... Uh, so end day shield is the first thing there, and the second thing is the resilience seed. So while you're in this weird state, when you're in this part of the game where you only have one HP, one MP on all your characters, if you try to use a seed like this, so you'll see right here, so this seed menu... It, it very awkwardly closes quickly compared to the other ones, right? So it's like in this semi-glitch state where the text box is really fast because the game doesn't know how to tell the player that although they're getting a benefit from seeds, their HP and MP is stuck at 1 for this part of the story. But once you walk out of this room, it goes back to normal. That's part of like the whole um, story events. But it means in the state that while you use seeds, you can use them very efficiently because the menu is really quick because you get one less text box and it closes really fast. So um, you do that. This is a very large menu that I used to do a little bit later, but the idea is that you have to redistribute all of your important inventories that you took off of other people's equipment and redistribute them for the end of the game. Just a lot of setup here. Okay, uh, and then at the end of this, we do this where um, Chamorro is going to use all of these seeds. So you see how fast this is? Chamorro is just using these agility seeds. Now he's using the life nut. So it's just very quick. And at this point, we're done. So we leave. Come back to Greetown in a minute. This is all just kind of story stuff. Really nothing that interesting. And then as soon as you get to prison, you go back to Greed Town and you do a bunch more shopping. So, I'm not going to cover the shopping too much now, but basically, we'll be back for some stuff later. But really, right now, all we pick up is the mirror shield that goes on Terry. And then we pick up the... well, we're also selling a lot of stuff right now, as you can see. We pick up the dragon robe, which is in town. Oh, we picked up here the Magante bracelet, which we sell immediately for 7,500. Uh, we pick up the Dragon Robe, which goes on Drango. Very, very good piece of equipment. 
and then we buy a demon hammer for Hassan and Drango, which is very high attack power, but has a very high miss rate. But if you attack and connect a hit, it's a critical hit. So, uh, interestingly, in this game, if you use power up on one turn and then you just do a single target physical with the demon hammer on the next turn, it guarantees a hit. And we can use this to our benefit because it also means that if you use power up on one turn and then spirit punch on the next turn, regardless of what your equipment is, Hassan will not miss spirit punch. This depends on whether or not the enemy has any resistances to spirit punch, but for any enemy that doesn't, it's a guaranteed hit. And demon hammer also comes with a huge amount of attack power, so it's all good. All right, we're getting to the final stretch here. Uh, this fight, this guy is very susceptible to spirit punch, so he takes a ton of damage. Uh, he can use critical attacks on your party, and he can do a lot of damage, so you have to be careful. But we put Drango and Hassan at the end of the party and just hope that Terry and Almost at the beginning of the party just defend mostly and, um, you know, don't die. This year, here. This is a turn where Hassan's going to attack. We'll see how much damage it does. 166 and then 750 was Hassan's powered up attack, which is huge. Uh, this guy, I think he's a 2800 HP. He can use a move called Thick Fog. Which gets rid of all buffs and debuffs and also means you can't cast magic for the rest. He actually used it on turn one, but we hadn't yet used any buffs or debuffs, so it wasn't a big deal. But yeah, that's pretty much just using buy kill on Drango and Hassan. And Drango just uses straight physical attacks for about 200 damage per turn, which is really good. Because you just give her a dragon killer and that's it. And then Hassan is doing power up punch for huge damage. Uh, from here, this is just like straight up story segment. Um, yeah, they went, I'd do some prep. Save the game. This is one of the last safety saves I did. I think I did one for Zuikaku and Shokaku as well. Anyways, Akbar fight's coming up now. All right, Akbar fight is the first fight where I did I didn't have the Sage of Stone anymore. So this was like the first time where I like really, I mean, I had another run that made it, but this is the first run where not having the Sage of Stone means you have to approach this fight very differently. Instead of being able to just spam AOE heal, you only have single target heal. And you have to use the World Dew, which is everybody gets healed to max one time limited use item. You can get another one after this fight, but Almost always you're going to be like guaranteed to need to use it on turn three in this fight because of how much damage you take. This fight has been going really well so far. The enemies have been distributing their attacks, which is what you want across your party members. And yeah, so right there, Terry surviving was like really, really huge because if he died, it would have been really bad. You have two world leaves on you, so you could revive him and restart the battle with Sands of Time, but... In this case, I'm using the World Dew right now. And then, uh, what I was about to say was, Akbar is susceptible to Stop Spell, which is what you really need, because he uses both Defense Down Rukanon Spell, and also will straight up revive his allies. It's not even Vivify, it's Revive. 100% susceptible. Uh, the, the one thing that did go bad at the beginning of this, which is that I tried to use the confuse item on the bottom guard and if the bottom guard gets confused that means you can just ignore him for a few turns and just focus on the top one or the leftmost one uh, unfortunately that did not happen so we're dealing with what we are right now which is the cure slime shows up it's not that big of a deal because you're not attacking or you're not healing uh i'm sorry you're not attacking akbar so you're not really worried about the cure slime healing and we're still going to use a powered up Hassan to take out the Guardian on the left. So Drago can take out the Heal Slun one attack after being buffed with Bykill. And then Hassan can just uh, use Double Edge Slash. 
So Akbar is not susceptible to Spirit Punch, so you have to use Double Edge Slash. Um, so at this point, it's like these three characters alive. Hero did die. It's not great, but it's not that big of a deal. Terry's the one that's healing. Drango is just using single target physicals for about 200 damage, and then Hassan is trying to do power up and uh, power up into double edge slash. So anytime Hassan attacks, you see this effect, which is you'll see it this turn, is that he'll use. Actually, yeah, yeah. In this case, I backed off and decided not to use it, but I was trying to describe what happens when you use Miracle Sword into Double Edge Slash. But here, he just got... Actually, let's go back and watch it quickly. So, this is Drango. This is Hassan doing an attack, 113 damage. So, he's just got the Miracle Sword on, so he'll do his damage. 375, so he's going to get 25% of that back as HP. So that went directly, so he's got 206 here. And then he gets more HP back because of the uh, spirit armor he has. So he went from, what, 113 to max HP in one fell swoop. Uh, so when you use the double-edged slash move, you, you take recoil damage, but you take it after you take Miracle Sword recovery. So let me see if I use it here. I do, yeah. So just go through this slowly when he attacks. See what happens. So he's at 143. So here. So 143. 535 means he's going to get a ton of HP back. 242. So he's at max HP. And then he takes 133 damage or recoil damage. But he recovered before. So he's safe to do that. And then at the end of the turn. Because he's got the mystic armor on. He gets 50 HP back. So it's a really really nice setup. Yeah, uh, Akbar. I mean, Akbar still does a lot of damage to you. He's got Quake, Fire Breath move, uses single target physicals. You cast Upper on yourself twice to try to make it through this fight. Um, so as long as he gets hit with Stop Spell at the beginning nicely, he's usually not too bad. Hero was able to land Sap Spell once, which is good defense down once yeah and then from there um that was, that was a good act bar fight it wasn't great but it was good landing stop spell right away is a big deal but unfortunately not landing the confuse on the guardian caused some issues but thankfully terry didn't die so it's all good all right do some inventorying uh i'm gonna fast forward and try to speed this up basically you do a segment tomorrow alone do some final preparation and we get into Zuikaku Shokaku, penultimate boss. Uh, this fight... This fight is scary on like turn 3 or 4, based on the way... So these guys are on very scripted patterns. They both do very specific things every turn in a big cycle. So this turn here... Basically, you're just setting up Hassan, Drango, and Terry with... Actually, you set up Terry with buy kill first because Terry has a move called uh, Wind Slash right there. And interestingly, Shokaku on the right is actually weak to wind. But yeah, this right here, that was big AoE damage from Zuikaku on the left. And anytime that that move is coming, you have to be really, really careful. Um, so we're on turn three right now, which is exactly that move right there is a power up from Shokaku on the right. And if he hits like Terry or somebody that's trying to heal on that turn, it's very bad. Um, Hero right now is the one that's set up with the Gent Kane, so he's the primary healer. So you really want to keep him alive. But you can see how much ridiculous damage Hassan can do to Shokaku on the right after landing Sap once. <sighs> but this fight is going pretty well. Um, that was a little scary there because that was AoE into single target on the hero, but naturally uh, he did survive, which is good. This point should be that the um, Chokaku survived, or is dead this turn. Yeah, 890, huge damage. Once Weehaku's by himself, 
He has that huge AoE attack, but he's got like seven turns before he does that again, and I think he does single target physical twice. But he mostly uses defensive moves, because the idea is that the game like kind of expects you to defeat Suikaku first, because he does healing and uh, protective s skills for the two of them. But if you know which turns to attack on, you can take out a Shokaku quick quickly before he gets a chance to heal him. So that's what we do. Um, but yeah, from here, you just kind of use the hero to make sure you stay healed up and don't take too much damage from his big AoE. And then it's pretty much just over from there. Nothing scary once you get Shokaku down. Uh, Alright. So with that, final dungeon is accessible. We do a bunch of re-inventorying at the end here. Uh, let's see. We come in here just to get the Demon Spear and the Book of Dragons. Demon Spear sells for almost 20,000. So it, it effectively affords you one World Leaf by itself, which is great. And then... The Book of Dragons allows Hassan to turn into a dragon, so... Um, it's really not too interesting, we just pick them up and then we leave. Yeah, yeah, so here... This, I was like, extremely excited. So if you see this encounter, the two Metal Slimes, you can spend one turn getting your party out, and you just wait because they will all come together to make a King Metal. So then, I was about ready to, you know, go all in and try to get this guy, but then he, of course, just runs away. But... Yeah, I was, like, cursing, you know? Cursing myself because pretty soon we have to try to get one King Metal Slime. So, I mean, that could have been it. Could have just been done and over. Oh, this is really interesting, and I didn't realize this until recently. So, if you check out right here, if you notice on the top right... Okay, so where Hassan is, three tiles up. You see that big stretch of right-facing tiles, right? and how the last one in the row to the right is facing down. If you go into this next room, which is a heal, right? So we get our party healed, put Hassan back in, and you do this, it's different. The top rightmost tile is facing right. So you can actually go up and to the right and save some steps. It's very odd, I don't, I don't know why. <laughs> But it is what it is. Because if you're in the same room... Hold on, let me... One more thing on this. What's really odd to me is that if you're in this room and you stepped on this switch and then stepped on it again, it would preserve this tile set. It's specifically when you go into that room and then come down while the switch is off, it does a different action of changing the tiles. I, it's very odd. Okay, anyways, come here. We get a dragon book. I don't really need to show this off. Uh, final preparation. I said before that you can pick up... You can have one max world do in your inventory at all times. So we used it during the Akbar fight. So we come back here at the end. Um, this again is like some clever inventorying to make sure that Terry gets the world map... Or sorry, the world do and the world leaf from Zenithia. Here we're cashing in... All of our small metals to get the Metal King helmet. So that's the benefit of all 70 metals that we collected. I collected 72. I've got two backups in there that are quick in case I forget any, but I actually did not forget any. I got them all. Uh, Dragon's gonna equip the Demon Hammer, and we're off to try to get a King Metal. Uh, oh, sorry, we, we first have to turn Hassan into a dragon. Um, and then we're off to get a King Metal. So come over here, we save the game, we warp here, and now it's the optimal time to use Barbara's ability to whistle. We just are going to get into fights. I think it was the seventh fight that I got a King Metal on. It was very good. So you're just running, you got a 10% chance of seeing a King Metal in a battle. Here he is. Uh, so he showed up with only one other guy, and we get him on our first try it. So in the grand scheme of things, extremely good. Not only did he show up under 10 battles, but he also um, stuck around for that first turn and we were able to kill him. The dude on the right used 
paralysis and paralyzed dragon, which was annoying, but as long as he doesn't kill anybody, you're able to get the kill. In this case, I used power up, power up, and then um, Chamoru used the ability to um, unparalyze Kiriaki, which is a move that anybody who is either paralyzed or asleep will wake up, which is good. So yeah, this level up sequence, let's see how long it takes. It's, it's kind of ridiculous. Yep, it's almost a straight minute of leveling up, so it's a pretty big deal. All right, at this point, uh, we're doing our final preparation. With this route, we sell off every single thing that we have extra to get us to 74,000 gold. We spend 33,000 of it getting a mirror shield for Hassan. Then you give the Ende shield to Chamorro. We were talking about that earlier. That leaves you with 40,000 gold for which you can use to buy two more leaves from the casino. We get 74 here. Pick up the mirror shield. Um, doing our final inventorying. So right here, with 40,000 gold, you can buy 2,000 coins from the casino. And that allows you to buy two leaves. So at this point, I hadn't actually used any world leaves, which is huge. So that actually comes in uh, like in extremely clutch in the final fight. I think I used all five of them, maybe? It was a big deal. Anyways, uh, I'm doing some final inventory here. All right, so I'm looking for that. We've got five leaves, two on Dragon, two on Terry, one on Hassan. Chamorro technically has Vivify, so if somebody dies, he can try to revive them in battle, but it's usually not great. And then, yeah, from here we save and make our way towards the final boss. I'll be right back. Alright. Um, we'll probably watch most of this final fight. I like to commentate, and I, I kind of want to just watch it back. It is a 25 minute fight, so I probably will speed up a few things. Um, but it was first try, which is great. It's just a really long fight, and there's just a lot to consider. So, I would recommend if you are like interested in learning more about this fight that you really understand the patterns that he does because it's a huge deal for the strategy. At the very, very beginning of the fight, he's on pattern A with this form, meaning that his first action is going to be an AoE either fire or ice move, and then he has a chance of doing a single target physical. So turn one, you get Hassan set up with power up. Dragon's going to use Sword of Ramius. So, in this case, he didn't do a single target physical, meaning that his next action is going to be a single target physical. And then, then from here, Chamorro and Terry are going to heal. Chamorro's got the agility ring on, so he either tries to go before or after the boss by either equipping or unequipping the agility ring. Hassan is going to use a pretty standard setup of 
power up into double edge slash on this form. You can't use spirit punch on this form. Dragon is for the rest of this fight only going to do physicals uh, when when dragon attacks. It's only using the demon hammer to do physicals. So uh, on that turn, I didn't know whether he was going to stay on the B pattern and the A pattern. So um, oh no, I, I sorry, I take that back. That happens later in this fight. Uh, in that case, I knew that the AOE attack was coming, so I only had two party members out to reduce incoming damage. Um, but now he's on the B pattern, which is uh, a little unfortunate because you take Ionazun, which is explode it. But in this case, he actually did not poison anybody, though he tried to, so that was good. Again, this is one of the fights where I don't have the Sage of Stone anymore, so I only have the... Um, the Gent Cane for single target healing on Terry. Uh, he's being kind of rude right now. He healed himself for 500 HP and then... Um, used Freezing Wave, so I have to reapply my buffs. So in this case, yeah, I'm trying to understand what part of the cycle that he's in right now. I'm trying to be cautious, but generally everybody's HP is like not great right now. So I think at this point, uh, there's a junction for which sometimes you don't know if he's going to switch patterns or stay on the same pattern. So I have to play very carefully and specifically. So in this case, Tremoro going first is good. Getting meditation there is kind of annoying, but um, it's basically a wash. He heals himself for 500, but then if you, you know, if it, Hassan lands 450 damage, it's just kind of a wash. I am going to speed up the rest of phase one. From here, it's just like keeping track of his HP and healing. I don't think I use the World Dew, which is something you sometimes do use in phase one. It's very nice to keep it for later in the fight, but um, I think I actually do keep it until phase three, which is super good. Anyways, we'll get through the phase one. It's just a lot of like keeping track of if a big AoE is coming. Staying healed, hoping that he doesn't use Freezing Wave or heal himself too much. I would say this phase one was pretty slow. Yeah, yeah, so in this case, it's actually pretty dangerous. This is where I decided, I think I did gamble a bit, right? Because I didn't want to use, yeah, if, if Terry got hit in that turn, that would have been really bad. I didn't want to use the um, World Dew yet, right? Because we're about to transition to the next phase. Okay, phase two, uh, maybe just take a second. So phase two strategy is that you need to reapply your buff on Hassan for his attack power up. Terry is going to use, um, often uses the Graco Spear on turn one, which is single target defense up to yourself, which is really good. Nice item to have. And... Chamorro heals and Hassan is doing the standard power up, but now Hassan can use power up into spirit punch. Unfortunately, this boss can cast Skara, which is upper, on himself to increase his own defense. Uh, yeah, I think on this turn I decided to prioritize healing. So this boss is the slowest of the three forms, and often Chamorro will go first. He started off the battle by using Skara on himself, which is just annoying means that Hassan's damage output is going to be less. It's really, really annoying when he does that as his first action because it just makes the fight go on even longer. If Hassan is able to get power up into Spirit Punch by turn two without Deathmore using upper on himself, you can do a ton of damage. But if he does, it just doesn't work out. But now that he's got kind of upper going, um, means that your damage output's really kind of low. Yep, so that's a great example. Uh, I was just talking to somebody about this the other day. So... Do you notice how I deal 27 damage here? So... Deathmore has part of his AI cycle. He can use defense. Uh, I guess it's defending champion. It, it basically means that you take 10% incoming damage, which is very good. But strangely, he doesn't actually show that he used this move. 
So here he used Rukanon, right? And that was it. Just that was the only move he does. But it was as if he used the defense reduction incoming ability. So I don't know. It's very odd. Anyways, it's really annoying when your dragon lands a critical hit. And then, uh, just takes 10% of the damage instead of 100%. So whenever I'm doing this, and I was actually kind of flustered during this part of the run, because he was doing, like, very difficult things to parse right now. And I end up taking a lot of single target damage to Dragon, his, Dragon and Hassan. I was feeling somewhat demoralized because it was like th three turns of him doing this. The reason I'm only having one party out and defending is that throughout all of this, he had a significant chance of using an AoE fire breath move. And you really want to avoid that if you can. But um, thankfully, I was able to to deal with all that, not die. But he has cast by kill at this point, and it's, it's really scary. So... Uh, especially in this phase, more than any other part of the game, I really try to keep track of how much HP damage we've done. Um, now that now that he has cast Upper twice on himself, Hassan is really not doing that much damage, and you really just have to like hope that Dragon starts getting criticals. And um, yeah, so that right there, that move is it's part of the cycle, um, and you have to be really careful to not get it to spawn too much like right now i'm defending again exactly because that breath move could be happening and now you don't know what's happening after this but this is your best chance to try to heal get your party back and going hp is like like this looks sketchy and bad but tomorrow has single target full heal all and usually goes first so um as long as you don't, don't get too dominated. So, okay. I'll say this. So, right here, he's taking an action. If you see that he's taking either Bykill or Rukanon, it means that he's on pattern B, and it's very scary, because if he follows up with the next action, it could be the spin kick move, in which is a physical to every party member. And with buy kill applied, it, it can do so much damage, especially after Rukanon, which is defense down. So he can debuff you, buff himself, and just like do a ton of AoE damage. So thankfully that didn't happen on the turn, but it can happen. It's really terrible. So um, yeah, a lot of this is like, I'm scrambling a little bit in the menu, but a lot of it is just like figuring out the game plan of how to mitigate damage and that was annoying right there. You can see how much damage does, 120 to everybody. That's why I'm trying to avoid it so heavily, but yeah. At this point, I'm still like really far away on damage. I've only dealt 1100 out of the uh, 3000 I need. So I really need Dragon to go. Um, but you know, if you, if you play cautiously and carefully, you can make it through this phase. It's just, it can be really annoying. Um, I do defeat Deathmore first try in all of this. Yeah, that was bad. Um, but it sure wasn't looking good at this point, because Chamorro's down, my entire party is looking rough. I think, yeah. Actually, I don't know. What do we do? That was a really big miss. Yeah. See, I had to stay there, because the same thing could happen, the breath attack. I think I used the... Um, World do here, and I use a leaf on Chamorro. But again, I'm only like halfway done with the HP, and he's buffed, and it's it's rough. It just sucks so much when Deathmore Phase Two uses Upper immediately, because it just it just straight up makes the fight take way longer than it needs to. If he if he doesn't use Upper, yeah, yeah. See, I just use the uh. I just used the do, and I'm already at like critical HP on everybody, so. Do you see that? It's, it's interesting. So if you notice, right here, I take an action. The game actually takes like, what, like 10 frames? You see that pause? 
That's the game doing like crazy calculations to figure out what to do with his pattern. He's like switching between A and B and back and forth. It's just, you can tell sometimes the game is chugging. See that? Like how there was no decision, how it was like instant versus like 10 or 15 frames it takes. <sighs> I'm going to speed through this though. It's a lot of just like really being careful and trying to heal and it does actually go pretty well. Dragon is able to land a bunch of crits and um, make it through, but the early part of phase two is really scary and I felt like I was going to lose. But I managed to not lose, it just took forever. At this point, I had about 400 HP left, and Dragon was really struggling to uh, to get any crits. So I started doing things like Terry and Hero using Thunder Sword and the Fire Claw, respectively, to try to just um, do 70, 80 damage at a time to clutch him, clutch him out. We eventually get there, I think. Sure it took a while, but... In order to survive this long on Phase 2, he kind of needs to cooperate and not do ridiculous things, and he did, but it was really slow. Uh, but, I mean, any Phase 2 that you don't die is a success. Alright, Phase 3. Let's just watch this. Phase 3... Phase 3 is really interesting to me, but um, my HP for Phase 3 right here is really good. Turn one, what you do is you you cast buy kill on Hassan. Terry is gonna emergency heal whoever needs to. Hassan's gonna power up, and then Chamorro is going to try to be as slow as possible, and he's going to use Kiariki, which is to try to if anybody gets well, someone sorry, someone is going to get put to sleep, and if Chamorro is not the one to be put to sleep, as long as Chamorro doesn't die, he's gonna get them to be awake on that same turn. If Chamorro is the one that gets put to sleep, it's okay, because the idea is that you really don't want Hassan to be put to sleep because you want him to be powered up. If Hassan gets put to sleep, it means that he is not going to be able to execute his power-up move. I actually think that is what happens here. So it means that your first damage output is going to be low. So right here, yeah, Hassan, Hassan got hit by power-up. I'm oh, sorry, by sleep, so he could not power up. Uh, so that's all turn one. Turn two... So Deathmore, the the head, is on a specific pattern, which he's going to do the next like five actions are going to be the same. His second action is going to be Raging Roar, which is a big physical attack to everybody. Um, Dragon barely survives this, but... Uh, and one other thing, so... At this point, you're like just scrambling to literally do any amount of damage that you can to the, the left hand, the right mode, stage right hand, what's called the left hand. Uh, because that's the one that can revive the other parts if it dies. If they die. So, sorry. The stage right hand that you see, which is called the left hand, can revive the other parts. That's all. So you just gotta take it out first. So you scramble to do as much damage as you can to that. Amos is equipped with the Megazaru bracelet, meaning that when he dies, the rest of the party will fully revive. So you scramble, you do like literally anything you can do to do as much damage to the left hand. And then when it's time for everybody else who is dead to revive, you try to time it very nicely such that the end of the turn happens when Amos is uh, about to die. And then everybody comes back and then you set up and you just hope that you can charge through the rest. So here, uh, so this turn, the, the head is going to use Blaze Most, which is a single target spell. It's very manageable. The other hands can do a lot of things. Hands can use Freezing Waves, the right hand. So stage left hand can use Freezing Waves. So often during this segment, if you're going to try to keep uh, Dragon alive, you really want to make sure that um, Drango is using freezing waves, uh, sorry, using Sword of Ramius to cast by kill on Hassan over and over in case freezing waves happens. Okay, so now this turn, this is turn four, where on turn four, the head is going to use freezing waves, guaranteed. If you have a buff applied, which we do, we have by kill on Hassan. 
So this is theoretically the safest time for Barbara to be swapped in to use Medante. So she's going to do about 400 damage if she survives. So the idea is that during the Freezing Waves turn is the safest time because there's only going to be two actions from the enemy. It's also important during this this part of Deathmore's head phase, he only goes once per turn. That was a really good turn. All right, so that that's applied. So that happened really quickly. So freezing waves happened, and then the action after Drango reapplied by kill to Hassan. That was huge. Madante, was that Barbara actually? That that missed. That was a spirit punch. Yeah, to Barbara. That. Like, honestly, that may have saved the run, like, un unironically, because if she got hit there, I would have been down 400 damage, and I think it gets sketchy later, but that was just like a natural miss, which is huge. So she survives, she gets this off, and then Hassan has his whole setup and does 822. So without even death cycling yet, I've done 1200 out of the, um, no, actually 1300 out of the... 2,000 for defeating left hand. So, uh, on turn 6, which is where we are now, this is freezing Blizzard from the head. And then now, Deathmore is on pattern A, which means that he can do 1 to 2 actions per turn. And it's Blaze Most, Explode It. He can do Pyre of Fire, which is like a stronger version of Blaze Most. Does like 150 damage, single target. Or he can switch back to pattern B and start doing... Uh, if he if he puts anybody to sleep, then you know that he's on pattern B. But at this point, we're just scrambling. We're just doing as much damage with um, anybody as possible. Keep uh, people alive. We're not trying to really heal to stay alive. We're trying to heal to see like max damage output that we can do. So Chamorro dies here. We're trying to keep Hassan alive and Terry alive so that they can do damage. Another 366. So that's too bad that that missed because that would have killed uh, the the hand. But we're very close. And I think I managed to kill it before. Yeah, so I decided to use the priority move, the Shippu move here, to do 148 damage. And then uh, this puts it down to 34. So the, the stage right hand here has 34 HP. So even if everybody dies here... Which is not the case. Um, <laughs> actually, yeah, this is really interesting because Terry basically always goes first because he's very fast naturally and has the uh, Meteor Iron Band equipped. So the fact that all of that happens specifically to leave Terry with one HP to be able to use the the Sword of Thunder to kill the the right hand, the stage right hand, left hand. So left hand is dead now. So, this is what I was saying before. So, Amos is the one that's, once he dies, the second character here, once he dies, he's going to fully revive everybody. I, right now, I'm just trying to decide, like, how I'm going to do it. Though, honestly, there's not much to decide. I probably should have just gone. Just want to make sure that he's set up and everything is right. Uh, but this basically went perfectly, right? So, Amos is dead. Everybody else is revived he's killed and then we bring out our party and it's basically go time right we set up again and we just have to hope for the best now this is very this was like a really really good thing that happened as part of the cycle because deathmore two turns ago used lullabies which is put one person to sleep which means that he's on his b pattern so he's on his b pattern and then the next action he took was Raging Roar, which was the huge damage that killed Barbara and Amos. So now we're at the quote-unquote docile part of the cycle, such that it's like the best time to buff Hassan and get ready to take out the, uh, the right hand. So that's what he's going to do. Drango's going to cast Spy Kill on Hassan. Terry's just going to do some extra damage at the beginning of the turn because nobody needs to get healed. And then Hassan's going to power up and then 
now we use Terry and Chamorro to, to heal up and try to keep the first two alive. Um, but yeah, I think if you're at this point in the run, or sorry, the fight, and you're pretty stable, you can usually clutch it out. Outside of some really bad things happening, you can usually clutch it out. That was an unfortunate... Um, actually, yeah, that worked out. That was the same as before, where he used Freezing Waves, but then Drango was ready to uh, deal with it. Had Buy Kill ready, pre-applied, and then Hassan did a ton of damage, so... Uh, the right hand here has got about 700, 800 HP left. Um, brought in Hero there to take the damage from the Freezing Blizzard. And then now, uh, we don't know what Deathmore is going to do. So he did um, Ionazune. Only went once per turn. But uh, now we're just doing regular... Yeah, yeah, nice. So that was actually enough to kill. So um, actually, I think the right hand took a little bit more damage than I was expecting. <laughs> Both when I was doing the run and right now. But that makes sense because Terry was using the Thunder Sword quite a bit. So took a bunch of damage. Okay, so at this point, Deathmore is, like, definitely neutered and cautiously optimistic. You're not really out of the woods until you're actually done, because he can spam Explode at a lot and really start to wear down your party just like this. And it's hard to keep up with AoE damage, and he can go twice per turn. Um, but usually it's okay. I don't think he casts Madante. Uh, so once he gets towards lower HP, I actually don't know what the threshold is, but he can cast Medante and deal a huge amount of AoE damage, but um, as long as it doesn't fully kill your party. As long as you have Terry alive, if you get to that point, usually you've got enough momentum to, to clutch it out towards the end. So here I am, I'm playing a little bit slowly, but I, I remember looking at the clock and knowing that I had to finish within like two minutes or three minutes in order to get the sub eight goal. Um, but yeah, any any crit from Dragon during this whole part is really, really clutch. And you can't use Spirit Punch on the head. You have to use Double Edge Slash. So we switched from the Metal King Sword. I didn't really talk about the Metal King Sword, but we picked it up right at the end. Oh yeah, that's right. This happened. So Terry got hit by Blaze Most into Explode It. So, luckily, and this is what I was saying before, I think I used all five of my leaves, and it was a really big turn. So, unfortunately, um, he got put to sleep. Dragon. So this is where I was, like, really starting to freak out. So I think I used Malayu here. Uh, I think I do switch back to Malayu. But the idea is that he used... No, I used Hero, okay. Um... The idea is that he used the sleep move, so I know that he's going to be dead soon. Um, this is where, if I was counting like very specific exact damage, it would have been quicker. But um, I'm trying to figure out how to handle this right here. But the idea is that he's very close to being killed, but I also really don't want to blow it all up. So I opt to have Chamorro use the numb off ability to awaken Dragon. And then Hassan is just going to go in for some damage while I use a Leaf with Dragon. And I think Freezing Wave is happening here, yeah. But I knew that was going to happen. And then we do this, and it was enough. So, in that case, it was a little scrambly at the end there, but that choice to, to get rid of Dragon's sleep such that Dragon could awaken to use the buy kill ability on Hassan to finish it was the right call. Scary, but turned out well. Uh, that fight was like, it was good. Good in terms of decision making. Phase two was just like so slow, but uh, that phase three was actually really good. I wouldn't say the fastest of menuing, clearly, but not bad. I feel like the decision making throughout all three phases was good and uh, was enough to win. So, all right. Well, that's really it. Two and a half hours of commentary of clicking around, but um, 
It was a good time. And I, I'm really, really happy to have finished a first try death more attempt, and it was just good. Alright, that's it for this video. Thanks for thanks for listening and watching.